Well, in the presence of our dearest Lord, truly, substantially, corporally present in the most blessed of all sacraments in the Holy Tabernacle, and with his kind permission, we will begin our conference this evening with a reading from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Afterwards, the end, when Christ shall have delivered up the kingdom to God and the Father, when he shall have brought to naught all principality and power and virtue, for Christ must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. All things are put under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then the Son also himself shall be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Again, words taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Little Miguel Pro was a good boy. He had been born in the area of Guadalupe, Mexico in the year 1891. And Miguel Pro, like many at that time, had been raised by good, faithful Catholic parents. He was rightly proud that our Blessed Mother, that Our Lady, had appeared to Mexico in centuries past, carrying the very king of the universe in her womb. And as a result of that coming of our Blessed Mother, the Virgin of Guadalupe, the serpent god of the Aztecs had been crushed through the heel of the Virgin. And therefore, a city of God was formed in Mexico, where Christ reigned as king and his mother truly was queen. Of course, like many boys his age, Miguel did get into a bit of mischief now and then. When he was but a teenager, Miguel took and wore a cassock from a Jesuit priest and went out to the neighborhoods preaching his own parish mission and retreat. And accepted as a priest by the simple country folk, Miguel, of course, took up a collection. He collected all sorts of gifts, including cigarettes, eggs, and cheese. But eventually this practical joker would end up in the society of Jesus for real. But then the troubles came. In short, the serpent of the Aztecs came back to Mexico. Revolutionary and demonic men rose up that sought to build a city of man that would replace and topple Christ's kingship and his rightful throne. The true church was persecuted during the Mexican Revolution. The Holy Mass and public worship was suppressed, and any priest that was found was subject to arrest, prosecution, and yes, even death. And as a result of this situation in Mexico, Miguel Pro, Father Miguel Pro, had to adopt a number of disguises so that he could continue to fulfill the spiritual needs of the folks of the flock. He once dressed up as a mechanic and gave a series of religious talks to a group of chauffeurs. And on one particular occasion, he had one narrow escape from the authorities. As a result of trying to get away, it is said that Father Miguel spied a beautiful young lady, linked arms with her, whispering to her, help me, I'm a priest. The woman reacted well, and the two pretended to be a courting couple. This good priest raced back and forth on a bicycle throughout the city, administering the holy sacraments. And just previous to his own bloody martyrdom, Father Miguel Pro was offering Mass at a convent, and he revealed to the Mother Superior his thoughts. He said, quote, I offered my life for the saving of Mexico some time ago, sister, and this morning at Mass, I felt that God had accepted it. Unquote. Father Miguel Pro was soon arrested and falsely charged with an assassination attempt on the newly elected socialist and Freemasonic president of Mexico. The young priest, of course, received no trial, and on his way to face the firing squad, the police officer that had caught the saintly priest begged his forgiveness. Father Miguel put his arms around the officer and said, not only do you have my forgiveness, you have my gratitude. After praying for a few minutes, Father Miguel 
calmly stood before that firing squad with his arms extended in the form of a cross. And in a firm and clear and loud voice, he cried out, as all the martyrs of Mexico did, Viva Cristo Rey! Long live Christ the King! Thinking that this execution would bring fear into the hearts of the people of Mexico, the president of that country had reporters and photographers detail all the gruesome and horrible bloody things connected with Miguel's martyrdom. But his plan backfired because the people would put the picture of his martyrdom in their homes, in their houses throughout Mexico. It inspired them. A martyr like blessed Miguel Augustin Pro may have died, but as the Spanish say, Dios no muere. God doesn't die. St. Augustine, the great church father, and also known as the Doctor of Grace, St. Augustine once wrote a great book called Civitas Dei, the City of God. And in that book, he spoke of two cities that are on earth. One of these cities was formed by a particular kind of love. The love that formed the first city was a love of self, a disordered, perverted love of self, even to the point of hating God. This is called the city of man. It's an earthly city. And this earthly city of man brings disorder, it brings chaos, and eventually it even brings damnation to its citizens. But the love that formed the second city was the love of God, reaching to the point of eating, even hating oneself. This is the heavenly city. This is that Chivitas Dei, the city of God, which brings order, justice, and peace, and a proper return to God and citizenship in heaven above. Dear people, dear members of the mystical city of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, which is only the Catholic Church, dear people, the entire history of the world since the fall of Adam is whether or not man will build a city of man or will build a city of God. Will he build a natural city, a tower of Babel on earth, which rejects the kingship of Christ? Or will man be an instrument in constructing a godly city, a new Jerusalem, which accepts Christ's kingship? Will there be a city of man or a city of God is the question. In his infamous book called Rules for Radicals, Saul Alinsky wrote a special paragraph on the front page of that book where he dedicated his work to Lucifer. Saul Alinsky offered his book to Satan, the first radical revolutionary who rebelled against the established order and gained a kingdom in the process a city of man. Such a dedication, offering his book to Lucifer, written by a man who was both mentored in the past and inspired a number of our nation's leaders in recent memory, reminds us of that phrase, I would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. You know, Satan is ultimately the head of the first city, the city of man. When our dearest Lord walked this earth, he called the devil, quote, the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, and even the God of this world. But after that crime of deicide, after that crime of killing Christ Jesus on Good Friday, Satan saw his kingdom crumble right before his eyes that our Lord had defeated him by shedding his own blood. Christus vincit, Christus regnat, Christus imperat. Christ conquered the devil and the city of man by his saving death, and now he reigns upon the throne of his holy cross and commands us to build up a holy city upon this earth. But this lasting defeat of Satan only has redoubled his rage 
against the city of God. For he remains the head and leader of all those forces that are opposed to the supernatural life and the city of God. As I mentioned on Sunday, as the Jews of old largely rejected the true Messiah, so revolutionary men throughout the past few centuries have toppled Christ from his rightful throne in nations and societies. Liberal builders of a new world order have decided to build their kingdoms without Christ the cornerstone. Their city of man is ultimately built upon sand, and it is destined to collapse when the flood of grace comes forth in full measure. But until that time, traditional-minded Catholics, counter-revolutionary men, must reconstruct and restore all things in Christ, building up that city of God, which is firmly fixed upon that rock that is Christ, that is unmoved. Now, in Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, you will find the headquarters of the executive branch of our government, namely what we call the White House. Back in the late 1940s and 1950s, President Harry S. Truman decided to renovate the entire structure, which was in great disrepair. Some have even suggested that the whole building, the whole White House, be torn down and a new building be rebuilt. But government officials ruled against such a plan because they saw the tearing down of the White House as an act of quote-unquote desecration. When men began working on the interior bearing walls of the structure that were no longer adequate, they found in the sandy soil beneath the White House building the original stones upon which it was built. To President Truman's delight, who happened to be a 33rd degree Freemason, many of these stones bore the symbols of Freemasonry, square and compass, along with that G in the middle that stands for any God you want. Truman was also pleased to learn that in October of 1792, the Freemasons of Georgetown laid the first of these stones in the presence of George Washington. Afterwards, toasts were raised to the United States, to the President, and to the Masonic Brethren throughout the whole universe. President Truman then ordered that some of these stones be used in the reconstruction project. Those stones, Freemason stones, are still in the very foundation of the White House. The other stones that were not used were sent to the Grand Lodges of the Freemasons throughout every state in the Union to show the bond between Freemasonry and the founding of our nation. The toppling of Christ the King from his rightful throne the destruction of his kingdom, the Catholic Church, and the rejection of the Christian order, which seeks to lead men back to God, have always been the main goals of Freemasonry. For their God is literally Lucifer. Furthermore, Freemasonry is the very church of the city of man. This movement has its Antichrist. Freemasonry has its anti-apostles, it has its anti-prophets, and its disciples and fellow travelers who campaign and crusade against the program willed by God. These revolutionaries and other so-called enlightened men have rejected the seat of God, and they've rejected the supernatural realm. They reject grace, they reject faith. Being purely natural men, they have spurned divine revelation. They have rendered to Caesar more than Caesar is due, and they chose Barabbas as opposed to Christ. And like Judas of old, they betrayed our Lord and repeated the deicide of Good Friday by crucifying and eliminating Christ from any public influence upon the very world and society which he created and redeemed by his blood. 
these new men, with their new learning and their revolutionary ideas, brought about a novus ordo seclorum, a new order of the ages, where church and state were to be divorced, where soul, the soul of religion, would be ripped out of all political bodies. And so a soulless and secular state would emerge that signaled an official social rejection of Christ and his kingship. We will not have this man reign over us because we have no king but Caesar. The official political body today moves and acts without the soul of religion. Western governments, therefore, have become like corpses, a soulless and godless body, purely secular and irreligious. And so whether it's in Europe or it's in the Americas, this city of man has robbed Almighty God and his Christ of the rightful crown that they are deserving of and their sovereignty over all nations. And in this new order of things, politics would not bother with God anymore, and constitutions and laws would be written without paying much attention to the Ten Commandments. Finally, the true religion, Catholicism, would not be recognized and would simply be relegated to the realm of private opinion along with the other various false religions and beliefs. And this is to be expected. For any nation who will not enthrone Christ as king will never accept his church as queen. And so what has happened? As a result, we have seen that the very royal scepter of ruling has been ripped out of the hands of our dearest Lord. The little orb that the infant of Prague holds in his left hand, showing that he holds the entire world in his hands, it's been taken away from him. By not recognizing Christ as king, modern states are anti-Christian by nature. Although many statesmen may profess a religious creed in private, the state is, practically speaking, atheistic. As one Freemason observed, this is an interesting quotation. This Freemason observed the following. He said, quote, we brought about the French Revolution. Our ancestors thought it was in order to set them free, but it was no such thing. It was simply a change in masters. We rejected Christ. There is a vacuum. Some other master came in. This Freemason continued, quote, Yes, we guillotined the king, but now long live the state as our king. We dethroned the Pope, true, but now long live the state as Pope. We are driving out God, the Freemason responds. Now long live the state as our God. You know, back in July of 2013, I was very privileged to visit the city of Rome on pilgrimage. It was the first visit that I had to what is sometimes called the Eternal City. I offer the traditional Latin Mass every day in one of the various side altars of St. Peter's Basilica. Unfortunately, I was not able to offer Mass on that famous Clementine Chapel. I didn't have the right connections. It takes a lot to be able to get permission to offer Mass at that chapel, because the Clementine Chapel is literally right next to the very bones of St. Peter. The altar contains, in fact, a little window that you can look through and view the remains of the first pontiff. Archaeologists have proven beyond any doubt that the relics of the fishermen are present there. First, because when they did their archaeological digs in the past, they saw an engraving over the tomb, which in Greek simply read, Petros Aini, Peter is here. A second proof is seen in the fact that the very feet of Peter are missing from the relics. His feet are not there. And we know why. 
because we know that St. Peter was crucified upside down. And in their haste to bring him down from the cross, they simply chopped him off at the feet. Another proof that these are truly the bones and relics of St. Peter. St. Peter's Basilica, therefore, is literally built upon the bones of the first pope. Knowing this archaeological truth gives even greater meaning to our Lord's promise and his words. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And it's literally true. No matter the winds of revolutionary change, no matter the floodwaters of corruption and poison that issue forth from the mouth of the serpent, the church will stand firm. For even the very gates of hell cannot prevail against her. Christ, the rock of ages, and Peter, the little rock, will not fail. You know, Pope Leo the Thirteenth of holy memory infallibly declared the following. Pope Leo the Thirteenth said, Civil society, the state, our nation, must acknowledge God as its founder and parent. Note the adverb. Civil society, the state, must acknowledge God as its founder and parent. He continues, and must obey and reverence his power and authority. This 19th century pope then added, quote, Justice therefore forbids, and reason itself forbids, the state to be godless, or to treat various religions alike with equal rights and privileges, unquote. It is a crime for any state to be godless or irreligious. Because God has a plan. The Almighty has an organized program that he has willed and established to bring men to himself. That's why he sent his only begotten son, so that there could be an orderly return to the one who made us through Christ and his mystical body, the church. The plan begins very simply by all peoples recognizing Christ as king of all creation. And next... Societies truly must acknowledge his kingdom and, yes, favor his church. And in this divine plan, man's supernatural end is acknowledged and, in fact, is more important than any of his temporal needs. God wills that church and state, though distinct, are never to be divorced, but are to collaborate like the body and soul within a human being. It's a plan where the eternal law of God, the gospel of Christ, and the natural law become the foundational guide that guides legislators in writing the moral laws of a nation. And if you have a society like this, which at one time was present in the Christian world, you will have a society where man's life is elevated where true freedom is seen, where the full flourishing of the human person is experienced. And in this city of God, the rights of the Almighty are above the rights of man. And of course, in this city of God, the public worship of the Almighty is especially offered through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But most unfortunately, the plan willed by God to bring men into the state of grace, to bring them to their supernatural end, has been rejected by the revolutionary builders of a new city, the city of man. Now, many of us have heard of Woodstock. Perhaps some even knew someone who might have gone to that event up in New York. The Woodstock Musical Festival was held in Bethel, New York, in the Catskill Mountains back in August of 1969. This event for hippies and for music lovers was held at a 600 acre farm and drew more than half a million spectators. Tickets for this Woodstock event could be purchased beforehand or at the gate, but as is typical, three quarters of the attendees just crashed the gates and didn't pay at all. Free love, moral, licentious behavior, freedom from authority, 
It was all being billed as being a place to live as you wanted to live. Of course, the ideals of this counter-cultural movement had some serious consequences, including no sanitation, little or no food supplies, and a totally inadequate medical and first aid facility. In this city of man, it always leads ultimately to disorder and chaos. In that New York County in which the event was held, a state of emergency was declared by the governor. He seriously considered calling in the National Guard. And then there was the rain and all the mud mixed in as well. Altogether, 32 musical bands performed, including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Grateful Dead, and Credence Clearwater Revival. The lead singer of that last group I mentioned was a man named John Fogarty, and he described his band's performance in the following way. He said, we were ready to rock out at 3 a.m. in the morning. But out there in the field, there were half a million people asleep. These people were out cold, the music entertainer continued. It was sort of like a painting from a scene from Dante's Inferno. Just bodies from hell, intertwined in a sleep covered with mud, unquote. Now, though most people look at the Woodstock event and the hippie era with a sense of humor... That mindset present during that time period exposed a fundamental problem within the nation from the very beginning, from its very foundation. Woodstock and events like it are the inevitable end of the city of man in a secular, godless state that has publicly rejected Christ the King. See, a state that refuses to recognize that its authority comes from above cannot expect its citizens to obey and respect its authority. Why obey the state when it doesn't obey God anyway? A state that refuses to recognize such authority coming from above cannot expect its citizens to bow before it. A state that does not accept a higher law then itself will end up enacting legislation based on the will of the people or the agenda of some powerful lobbying group. Now, I freely admit that things were better, morally speaking, in the past. We didn't legally kill our own offspring back in the 50s. Guys marry gals. But the seed of the disorder... The chaos was already there from the beginning. We are just witnessing the full blossoming forth of a bad fruit from a bad tree. By way of analogy, a camel has humps filled with water, and it can survive in a desert for a very long time. But if that camel doesn't eventually return to the water, to the oasis, It will die at last of thirst. Its life principle, its animal soul will leave its body if it doesn't go back to the water. The Western world, even after the revolution against Christ the King and his church, still had some remnants of Christian culture that allowed it to survive in the city of man for a time. The hump, if you will, in Western culture, still had some reserves left of Christian thinking and activity. But now that we've been so far away from the living waters of Christ, our camel is dying. Not too long ago, I was reading the sacred scriptures, the inerrant Holy Bible, and I came across in the fourth book of Kings a story which told us of the kingship of King Josiah. Before King Josiah, a holy king, before King Josiah ascended the throne, the Jews had endured a time of great social apostasy with many wicked kings leading the people away from the true God so they would worship idols instead. In fact, the evil rulers that led the Jews at that time before Josiah had burned as many copies of Moses' writings as they possibly could, especially his book of Deuteronomy, his last sermon 
to with God's people. But one good priest, one good Jewish priest at that time, hid a last remaining copy of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' last sermon. He hid it in a box and eventually concealed it in the wall of the temple. And then years and years and years later, eventually when the temple was being renovated at the order of King Josiah, the book, the precious treasure of Moses' last sermon, the only copy, was found. It was then brought before King Josiah and read in his presence. He had never heard the sermon of Moses before. In that particular reading of Moses' sermon, the book of Deuteronomy, all the curses were listed that would come upon the Jews if they rejected the divine plan. When King Josiah heard this, all the curses that would come upon them if they did not keep the covenant, he rent his garments in grief. He realized that all the disorder, all the chaos, all the chastisements endured by God's people could have been prevented if only they had followed the program of Almighty God. And so King Josiah quickly went to work. The people did penance, a great Passover was held, and various abominations and idolatrous altars were burned. Well, for us, Christ the King is our book. He is the Word made flesh. But he was virtually crucified by the spirit of 1789 and the French Revolution. The city of God has seemingly been burned down, and we are suffering the consequences. The state has become monolithic. It is a massive structure that drains our resources. It literally spies on us daily. It violates our consciences. And it plays God, defining for us what is right and what is wrong. Most citizens today rarely practice the virtue of obedience, but we simply go along to get along. Economic matters are disordered with either a greedy form of liberal capitalism, or even worse, an unnatural, inhuman socialism. Our schools are oftentimes ungodly, and the arts and entertainment industry reflect this ungodliness. But there are, thank God, hidden writings and hidden books that will help us restore all things in Christ. You see, the answer to 1789 and the revolution against Christ the King is right before us. It is the 1925 papal letter, the papal encyclical by Pius XI, known as Quas Primas. And in that papal letter, on the topic of Christ's kingship, written on the 1600th anniversary of the famous church council known as Nicaea. We all know that council of Nicaea because it condemned the horrible heresy of the Arian heresy. And it produced that wondrous sentence in the creed where we believe that the Son of God, Christ Jesus our Lord, is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. The same exact substance, the same exact essence, the same exact God as the Father. And when this Son of God personally united himself with a human nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, that nature, that sacred humanity of Christ was elevated to an immeasurable level and dignity above all creation. The highest executive is Christ Jesus. The highest lawmaker is the Son of God become Son of Mary. And yes, the highest judge of all became man. And therefore, when he ascended into heaven, he could truly say to his apostles, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. But in his goodness, he then gave that power to his apostles. He said to his apostles, now you go out and you preach the gospel of salvation to all men and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost 
because he who hears you is hearing me. There is no Christ without the Catholic Church providing him for us. There is no king if he doesn't have a kingdom. No one comes to the king except through his kingdom. No other religion outside of the apostolic Roman church has saved a single soul or brought forth a single grace in the past 2,000 years. The Catholic Church has a complete monopoly on all saving graces and saving truth. And as the church teaches clearly, there is no true worship of God outside of her. And having been commissioned by Almighty God to bring men to their proper end, the freedom of the Catholic Church to fulfill that divine mission cannot be limited in any way whatsoever. As members of this kingdom, which is the church militant, we are against everything that is against God. And so therefore, we declare spiritual war against government without God. We take up spiritual arms against laws without God, marriage without God, science and art without God, schools without God, Wall Street without God. Because our party is the party of Christ the King. The first politician is God, and his platform is our one agenda. The ultimate cultural battle that we are experiencing for the past 250 years, dear people, the one thing that we are truly experiencing is determining whether or not the Christ, our Lord, who is King of Heaven, will he also be King of Earth? But there's one other series of writings that I think that we should know about. Not just Quas Primas of Pius XI, but also a book that liberals hate. In fact, many people, even the church today, would like to see this priest's writings burned. But there are still a few copies concealed here and there in certain libraries. And even a few newly printed copies of this priest's books put forth by small publishing houses. The author of these books was falsely labeled as an anti-Semite. His writings were considered outdated because of their pre-Vatican II orientation. But then again, as I tell people, Jesus Christ was also pre-Vatican II. <laughs> even his enemies, however, acknowledge that this priest did love and serve Christ the King. I figured he was just the kind of author I wanted to read. His name is Father Dennis Fahey. Father Dennis Fahey, and what makes him even more lovable is, well, he's Irish, of course. You might forget most of what I have said tonight, or even throughout this mission. But remember the charge that I give you this evening. Begin to read at least sections of his works. You will not be disappointed. His works are like a Bible on Christ's kingship. Father Fahey was born in Tipperary in the year 1883, and he lived until the mid-1950s. He became a religious under vows, joining the Congregation of the Holy Ghost, and while a seminarian in Rome, Father Fahey would ask permission from his superiors to spend many, many hours in prayer before the altar of the chair of St. Peter in the Basilica in Rome. That altar which literally has a relic of the chair sat upon by the first pontiff, the Bishop of Rome, St. Peter. And while he was in prayer before Peter's chair, Father Fahey would ponder and meditate upon the history of the world. And he repeatedly promised St. Peter that if he ever got the chance, he would teach about Christ the King and the way that St. Peter wanted. It is said that his heart and mind so identified with Christ the King that any opposition any opposition to the kingship of Christ caused him intense physical pain, even migraine headaches. 
Father Fahey proposed the divine program for mankind's return to God through Christ and his kingdom. This Irish priest then added that men and societies do not even have a right to propose any other alternative. Father Fahey's most famous motto, an oft-used phrase of his, was simply, the world must conform to the Lord, not he to it. But modern man and revolutionary governments still did not conform. And the results have been tragic. With the Prince of Peace no longer recognized as reigning, the horrors of wars only increased, with whole nations being annihilated, as Our Lady of Fatima warned. With the Lord of Life being forgotten, genocides of both the born and unborn have been committed by enlightened men but not enlightened by faith. With the bread of life supplying our needs being rejected, ungodly economic systems have arisen where greed is so present. With the giver of the law on Mount Sinai being ignored by rulers and courts, men have become lawless, promiscuous. And dear people, we are so susceptible at this moment to a rise of tyranny which will have to enforce our compliance in order to avoid anarchy and chaos. As I bring this conference to a close this evening, we must face a reality. From the looks of things, it seems that the enemies of Christ have won. We're all Freemasons now. At least we oftentimes think like Freemasons do. Revolutionary errors are everywhere, and they have penetrated into the minds of most every Catholic today. This stark situation must not lead, however, to our silence. It must not lead to our surrender. And it must not lead to our compromising with the revolution against Christ. It is our job to reestablish his kingship in ourselves. Let's begin there where we will subject ourselves to his will. It begins with our families to enthrone the sacred heart of Jesus over our fireplace mantle or some other prominent place in our home so he is king of our place. And eventually this can seep into our neighborhoods, into our larger sort of community connection, and maybe even one day to our nation. Because good people everywhere are observing something. They see it. They may not know the cause, but they know there's a moral collapse. But many of these individuals are looking for the wrong solution. They're looking for the goddess of liberty for aid. Tea Party patriots, God bless them. Conservative talk show hosts and listeners and lovers of the system that we have look for solutions in the Constitution, and returning to the ideals of the founders of our nation. They are invoking not the Holy Ghost and the Pentecost graces so present, but they're calling upon the spirit of 1776 and 1789 for help. But our founders and their documents cannot save us because spiritual problems demand spiritual solutions, and our founders did not give spiritual solutions. How can we suggest, as some do, that the Constitution was divinely inspired when there is actually no mention of God in the entire body of the text? Though naturally gifted with many, many natural talents, the founders of our nation were largely deists, who rejected the God of Revelation and his kingship over men. They knew that God existed, but they did not accept that he reigned as king over men. The Catholic Church alone is God's visible kingdom 
on earth, possessing all the means necessary to bring men to full perfection, enlightenment, and yes, salvation. If we would but follow our Lord's command to convert the nations, then Christ's kingship would be manifested to all. The great archbishop in New York in the 19th century, Archbishop John Hughes, he was very plain spoken. And Archbishop John Hughes said the following, quote, The goal of the Catholic Church is to convert all pagan nations and all Protestant nations. It is the commission that God gave to his church. Archbishop John Hughes then adds, Everyone should know that we have for our mission to convert the world, including all the inhabitants of the United States. The peoples of the cities, the people of the countryside, the officers of the Navy and the Marines, the commanders of the Army, the legislature, the Senate, the Cabinet, the President, and all converted to Christ and His Church. This task is certainly daunting, especially since it will be resisted by the devil who enjoys his present reign as a tyrant over liberal republics the city of man. But I know that it has been accomplished by Christians in the past. Christians brought conversion to pagan Rome through their witnessing and, yes, even through their blood. Catholics who were relegated to the very top corner of the country of Spain, having their whole nation invaded by Muslim warriors, over time, the Reconquista, the Reconquering began at the Battle of Covadonga. And they began over the next 700 years to regain victory and reclaim their homeland and to push the Muslims out. And believe me, those revolutionaries in the past that tore down Christendom and toppled Christ from his rightful throne, they didn't cower. They weren't afraid to take on the established Christian order. We would never copy their perverse methods, their lies and strategies, but perhaps we can at least begin to imitate their zeal. We must begin in small ways. We must begin in small ways by reining in those revolutionary passions and appetites, which I will speak about tomorrow. To allow Christ to reign in our hearts by putting down all rebellion within our souls. From there, we must bring peace and true concord to our Christian families and extend it to our neighborhoods. In short, we must begin rebuilding a Catholic culture that will permeate this society over time until a new Christendom emerges. All we need to do is start. As St. Joan of Arc said to her troops as they were about to enter into battle, she said, in the name of God, go forward boldly. I want to end now with a story of success. A story of success even in very revolutionary times. President Gabriel Garcia Moreno. He ruled as president of Ecuador in the 19th century. Before he became president, before he was freely elected for two terms... The entire country of Ecuador was ruled by Freemasons. But over time, Garcia Moreno, the president, began to establish Christian principles in his country. His famous motto, the motto of President Gabriel Garcia Moreno, was liberty for everyone and everything except for evil and evildoers. In short, he formed a little Christendom in South America. Gabriel Garcia Moreno attended Holy Mass daily. He made regular visits to the most blessed of all sacraments. He recited the Holy Rosary. He meditated each morning. He always had a copy of the Imitation of Christ in his vest pocket. And he also carried an actual life-sized wooden cross during a penitential procession of the people on Good Friday. 
He also consecrated his country along with the bishops to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and he made a special agreement with the Holy Father at that time, Pope Pius IX, that Catholicism was the official religion of the people of Ecuador. In addition, Garcia Moreno did so many other things which brought prosperity and, yes, peace to his land. And, of course, he was a staunch opponent of all corruption. And because the reign of Christ was acknowledged in Ecuador, the peace of Christ was present in Ecuador. This great leader, however, after 12 years of peaceful rule, would eventually be assassinated by a group of revolutionary Freemasons as he exited the cathedral after attending Holy Mass. These men of the Freemasonic Lodge shot him six times. They cut him 14 times with their swords and knives. Eventually, dying, Garcia Moreno was brought forth before a statue of Our Lady of Sorrows in the cathedral. And there he would be administered the final sacraments before his last breath. And he forgave all of his attackers and assassins. His final words were, Dios no muere. God doesn't die. These words of a martyr demonstrated his great confidence in the eventual conquest and victory of Christ the King. And so with St. Joan of Arc, Blessed Miguel Augustine Pro, Archbishop John Hughes, and yes, President Gabriel Garcia Moreno, let us be about the business of enthroning Christ the King in us, in our homes, our families, our towns, our cities, our nation, and yes, the world. Viva Cristo Rey. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.